You're listening to another inspiring teaching from Devonport Church of Christ, Tasmania, Australia. For more information about our church, please log on to www.devonportcoc.com.au. I was reading a website the other week that was li- listing doctors' funniest real-life stories that they had encountered with their patients. Uh, one of them was a guy comes into the emergency department via ambulance with burns on his lower extremities. His shoes are charred and the bottoms of his pants are definitely burned away, but his skin isn't so bad. He had been trying to use a propane-powered weed killer in his yard, think flamethrower, and things got a little out of control. I smelled alcohol in his breath, so I asked the guy if he had been drinking and he looked at me directly in the eye and said, No. I got drunk just standing next to him. It was a once in a lifetime setup and I couldn't help myself. As straight faced and professionally as possible, I said, Sir, liar, liar, pants on fire. <laughs> the paramedics all turned at once and ran out of the room. They were laughing so hard. The patient just stared at me. He was so drunk, it went totally over his head. Here's another one. As I leaned in to check her eyes, my older patient got a little frisky. You reminded me of my third husband, she said coyly. Third husband, I asked. How many have you had? Two. (laughs) Honey, these are going well. (laughs) My patient announced she had good news and bad The medicine for my earache worked, she said. What's the bad news, I asked. It tasted awful. (laughs) Since she was feeling better, I didn't have the heart to tell her they're called eardrops for a reason. (laughs) And finally, when I went to the ER to have a painful ingrown, ingrown toenail removed, I was sobbing, gagging, petrified, the works. But my doctor knew how to calm me down. Don't worry about a thing, he assured me. I just looked up how to perform this operation on YouTube. (laughs) Well, we're continuing our Jesus for Everyone series today and in the Gospel of Luke. And we've been camped for three weeks now in Luke chapter 5. And we've been learning about Jesus at the very beginning of his ministry. He has been teaching. He has been healing throughout Galilee. And he's in the process of gathering the 12 men who are to become his closest followers and disciples. Jesus is also starting to get noticed by the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day, the gatekeepers of the Jewish law. The cracks are starting to appear between the Pharisees' understanding of God and Jesus' teaching. This dynamic new word from this young rabbi is not saying quite quite what they would like to him to say. And after this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up and left everything and followed him. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. But sinners to repentance. This story clearly left a mark on the early church. This, This story written down by Luke, it's, it's uh, also recorded in all three synoptic Gospels. Synoptic just means similar. Matthew, Mark and Luke. Jesus is walking along the Sea of Galilee and now he stopped at the booth of a man that Luke calls Levi, but we know he's, later on he's, he's Matthew, to ask him to follow him. Levi was a tax collector. Now, for those of you not familiar with the scriptures, tax collectors were not well liked back then. I'm I'm sure they're not worshipped today either. Uh, Their job was to collect taxes for Rome, for the empire Rome, hated who were hated occupiers of their of their homeland of Israel. 
And these collectors of Roman taxes made their living by taking a little extra off the top for themselves. And if, you, if they thought you looked like a person that could give a little extra, well, so much the better. There were no court of appeals. Whatever these men said you had to pay, you paid, you had no choice. Thus the Jews hated these tax collectors and viewed them as little better than prostitutes. I mean, even the Romans really didn't like these guys. And according to one of my sources, Rome looked on them as being on the social plane as pickpockets and thieves. Nobody liked these guys. And I suspect when Jesus found him, Levi was tired of it all. He was tired of being rejected and turned away. Tired of being hated and spat upon. I can picture him being a sad and lonely man who just wanted out, but he didn't know how. You ever felt like that? I just want out of this circumstance, but I don't know how. He didn't know how to change who he was and what he was. And even if he did, nobody would let him forget what he had been and how he'd been making a living. But Jesus didn't care what Levi had been. He only cared about what Levi could be. And I just want to say to someone this morning, Jesus is not concerned on what you have been. He is more concerned in, on what you will be. Less concerned about who you've been and more concerned about who you shall become. And it's the same with Levi. To the Jews, Levi was a sinner. But in Jesus' eyes, he was a lost soul that needed to be saved. And not only that, he added another member to his band of disciples. Jesus' call to Levi was so scandalous. We don't really get it. We don't like tax collectors, but we really need to step in to how the, the way tax collectors were viewed in the first century, especially under Roman occupation. This is scandalous by Jesus. It would be like Jesus calling on a drug dealer at a crack house to follow him. It would be like me employing an associate pastor from our church from the crack house. Completely scandalous. But so simple. Levi or Matthew is so overwhelmed by his acceptance of Jesus' message, he decides to throw a party. When you became a Christian, did you throw a party? <laughs> I love this guy. He throws a party. It's his salvation party, friends. He doesn't do this in the corner. I'm going to have a little private party. He does it out in public. He does it so everyone can see. This guy's been transformed. I'm, I'm having a salvation party and I'm going to invite everyone who wants to come to my salvation party. He does it with pure joy and he has hopes that his Pharisee mates will join him. Have you ever noticed how often Jesus goes to parties? I mean, Jesus the party guy. He loves to party. Jesus loves to party. But it's at Matthew's party, a salvation party, a scene of celebration, that the Pharisees decide to take Jesus to task. This passage contains one of the most clarifying and defining statements Jesus ever made. In fact, to understand the statement is to grasp, to, is to grasp the essential uniqueness of Christianity. This statement in, is in verse 32 of our text. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And friends, in that sentence, Jesus tells us why there was an incarnation, why he was virgin born, why he lived, why he died, why he rose, why he ascended, and why he intercedes now. The whole glorious scheme 
of salvation is summed up really in that statement. He came to call sinners to repentance. The Lord Jesus came to save the sinners who would repent. (laughs) I want you to get this. And I I won't mince my, my words here. This lesson is so crucial and critical that I would venture to say that if you do not understand it, you probably are not a Christian in the true sense of the word. There I said it. If you think that Jesus saves pretty good people, basically moral people, church-going people, you do not understand the heart of the gospel. If you think that someday you're going to stand before God and say, I was a good person, I didn't murder anyone, never committed adultery. If you think that that's going to get you into heaven one day, friend, you're in for a rude awakening. I just want to say this. I'm I'm preaching the word of God here today. If you think that you're going to get into heaven because you're good, you are lost. Good people don't get into heaven. Repented sinners get into heaven. And this is meat and potatoes Christianity. And if you don't get the meat and potatoes, then you are, then you are on the wrong track and path. Who, who's with me here? Who understands this? This is meat and potatoes Christianity 101. We don't get into heaven because we're good. Who is good? You know, you say, but Blake, you don't understand. I've come to church every week. It doesn't matter. You don't understand, Blake, Blake, I actually actually give money and tithe out of every paycheck I get. Thank you very much. But still, that's not good enough. You, You don't understand, Blake, like I pray for you and I pray for your family. Thank you so much. But that's not good enough either. The only thing that gets us through the gates is that we are repented sinners who have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Saviour. I think, friends, that Jesus' words here should jolt you into rethinking your understanding of the Christian faith. Jesus came to call and save sinners. The Christian faith is not for good people. It's for sinners. The church is not for people who think they're righteous. Right with God. It's for people who know they're not. You hear this this criticism a lot. Well, the church certainly isn't filled with perfect people. That's true, but at least we know we're not perfect. That's why we're here. Do you want to know what the difference is between a messy church and not a messy church? One church is talking about it and the other's not. I'll just say that again. Do you want to know the difference between a messy church and and not a messy church? One church is talking about it and the other's not. We're sinners. All of us. Jesus came to call and save sinners. This is not a club for the righteous. This is a hospital friends for the sin sick. Can we understand that? Do you understand that? And, and have you, have you, I've noticed this. You know what? I am nowhere where I need to be. Just speak to my family, but thank God I'm not where I used to be. I'm nowhere near where I need to be. But thank God I'm not where I used to be. And I think that as the more you become a more mature Christian, where you understand the love of God and where you actually read Scripture and the Scripture becomes part of who you are. I'm not talking about memorizing Scripture. That's good, memorized and reading Scripture. But where where Scripture, where you read it, it becomes part of your DNA. 
that's a, that's, that's a deep, that's a good place to be. I've been doing 15 minutes in the chair every day because I asked you to. So I, leaders go first. So I've been doing 15 minutes in the chair every day, with devotion, reading, and I'm just doing this devotion before I go to India on John's Gospel. And it is just wrecking me in a good way. I'm loving it. Like I'm actually, I'll be honest, <laughs> the biggest thing for a pastor is I'm always in the word for sermon prep, but you know, this, it's the hazardous of the occupation. You know, you're always in the word for sermon prep. And then, but you don't get in the word for your own for your own personal devotion. But I'm telling you, I'm happy to tell you that that I'm you know I've I've gone to another level, of, and I love it. I can't get enough of it. Just deep stuff, and not just deep for deep. You know, I talked about that, but stuff that's 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 just amazing. Scripture's so rich. Jesus is so rich. Scripture just is so powerful. It is unbelievable. I just think I'm not where I used to be. But I think it's a sign of maturity to be unsettled and distressed about your sinfulness. So we could say the more mature a congregation is, the more they recognize their sinfulness. Could we not? The first step towards healing sin sickness is admitting that we have a need. I mean, I've never been to AA. But I know the principles of AA. What's the first principle of AA? I am an alcoholic. Hi, my name's Blake and I'm an alcoholic. No, my name's Blake and I'm not sure I'm an alcoholic. Well, no, no, you don't, you're not ready. My name's Blake and I'm an alcoholic. My name's Blake and I'm sin sick. My name is Tammy and I am sin sick. The first step is admitting that you have a need. That you are a sinner and you must do something about it. You know, false physicians give false diagnoses that lead to false hope. But God tells the truth, friends, about life and about sin and about death and about hell and offers the only remedy, faith in Jesus Christ. The religion of the scribes and the Pharisees could not offer no help to Matthew and his friends. But Jesus could. You need to know that believing that you have no need of God, you need to know that if you, if you believe that you don't need God, you don't need him, that you don't require any help from him, <coughs> is actually not being human. When a human believes that they, can, that they can navigate through life in their own strength and their finite abilities, they are so far from, removed from how God intended humans to operate. I want to throw a curveball in here this morning. And I just think it's not a, a, one, the indicator, but I, I think it might just, I just want you to get thinking. I want to throw a curveball in here for some of you who have been hanging around church for decades. When was the last time that you personally got on the end of a prayer line? Or went forward for prayer? Or approached somebody else for prayer? Your answer could suggest whether you have pride in your life. Jesus centered his ministry on the poor, prisoners, blind and oppressed. As Yowie said last week, and if you haven't listened to Yowie's message, I encourage you to listen to it on podcast. Yowie said, said last week that Jesus centered his ministry on what? On who? Outcasts. People who understood what their true condition is. Social outcasts. People who didn't live with any illusions. People for whom a deformity or a paralysis or a disease, even leprosy, or a social stigma that put them in the category of outcasts were much quicker to examine their own hearts honestly than those moving among the religious elite. Buying the lie that they were right with God. And so we'll see as we go through the rest of Luke's gospel over this term that Jesus spends his time with the outcasts. I mean, he even gained 
the label, the friend of tax collectors, sinners, and prostitutes. How would you like that on your resume? You are the friend of prostitutes. Um, some of us would balk at it. Do you know that every commentary I've read on Luke speaks to how important table fellowship was in that day? It was a sign of friendship and association. The table was a sign of identification with the ones you ate with. So Jesus provokes the Pharisees by his table association. One commentator in my reading says, in Luke's gospel, Jesus got himself killed because of the way he ate. Yeah, he did. I'm not talking about Big Macs and cholesterol. I'm talking about table of association. Who we, who we hung out with. Jesus got himself killed by the way he ate. Or the people he ate with. That's why we gave you this fridge magnet last week. Not so that, hey, look at our cool fridge magnet. But so that, so that eat and drink that you would aim to share hospitality with one Devonport Church of Christ person or one not yet Christian individual or family each week. I mean, why would, I, why would we get you to do that? Because Jesus modelled it. How on earth are you going to reach any non-Christians when you have no proximity? Because all you hang, because there are people, and you know, this is a, this is for pastors as well, you know. Because all we know are Christians. How how do we reach people if we don't have proximity? So that's why I'm saying to you: Why don't you eat with a coworker, have lunch, shout them a coffee? I, I don't know your circumstances, but of workplace, but take them out for lunch. Share coffee with them. Share hospitality. Eat with them. That's what Jesus did. He ate with them. We're not like close brethren. You know those those that you know those that cult where they don't they won't they'll 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 do business with you but they won't eat with you. Have you ever heard met those people? No, that's that's ridiculous. That's not Jesus. That's not gospel. Jesus ate with sinners. You and I. Are called to do the same. Are you with me? Do you understand? Get a magnet. Aim to do it. Jesus modelled it. But you know what? It's because these these people that Jesus ate with came to grips with their true condition that Jesus could Jesus could minister to them. They were the sick who knew they were sick. Not only physically but spiritually and desperately need the, the physician. And Jesus came then to the repenters. He came to seek and save the lost. What does the Beatitudes say? I mean, we were, we were singing some Beatitudes in that new song today. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. What does that mean? Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Now, we know the Beatitudes are uh, the Sermon on the Mount describing the characteristics of the kingdom of God, which is upside down to the world's ways. Blessed are you when you're poor in spirit. Now, the world would say, no. Nah. But Jesus said, blessed are you when you are poor in spirit. What does that mean? What was Jesus saying? You are blessed when you realize you are at the end of your rope and cannot do life in your own strength anymore and you need God. Why do you go to the doctor? Because you have a head cold, I don't know, a fever, travel injections, ouch, or you pulled a muscle from doing too much Zumba. Would you ever go to the doctor if there was nothing wrong with you? Your doctor would look at you and ask, what hurts? And you would say, nothing. Then he would ask, why are you here? And you'd say, because I just wanted to see you. And then you'd have to find a new doctor. Or a shrink. 
Jesus is saying, here is a healthy man. Here is a sick man. And there is the doctor. Meaning, the righteous, the sinful, and me. I mix with sinners because they have a need and I have a cure. The more painfully they feel their need, the more they will put themselves in my hands. Don't miss that. Their basic disease is sin. Sin leads to death and my message of salvation is its only remedy. You know, last Sunday, Yowie's message, we were reminded that Jesus wants to take care of our greatest need, our deepest need, our sin problem. You see, Jesus rejects the righteous in this, in this story. He rejects the, those who think they're righteous. You know, who thinks their waste doesn't stink. Am I speaking someone's language? That's what it is. Those who think they're better than others. Those who think I live on the better street. Or the better area of Devonport. Or I, I go to the better school. Or I go to a private I go to a Christian school. Or I go to that school. Or I got this job. Jesus rejects the righteous. Jesus is using sarcasm here when he is describing the healthy and sick. Jesus uses their own perspective by connecting, watch this, the sick and the unrighteous, unrighteous with the tax collector and sinner and the healthy and righteous with the Pharisee. He doesn't fight them on, the status, on their belief in the status of the tax collector. Instead, Jesus employs sarcasm in a subtle, parable-like way so as not to criticise them outright, but to make his point. It, and I, it warms my heart that Jesus uses sarcasm. You know, Jesus uses sarcasm to point out who the right candidate for his mercy is. The one who is the right candidate is the one who knows they are sick and need of the medicine. The one who knows they need to repent and call the doctor and need, need mercy. He's not implying that the Pharisees are well. They're all sick. They're both sick. The Pharisees are just as sick as the sinners. The Pharisees aren't healthy, even though they think they're healthy. They're all sick. And friends, we're all sick. We're all cracked pots. We're all broken. I'm no better than you and you're no better than me. Yeah? We're all on the same level. None of these guys' characters in our story, except for Jesus, are well. They're all sick. And they all need to call the doctor. He's pointing out that the only ones who can be made well are not just the sick, but those who know they are sick are in need of the medicine. They're all sick. We're all sick. And when you know you're sick, <coughs> you go to the doctor. I mean, you hear these stories of people who they get a pain in their chest or in their side and they go to the doctor the next week and he says, get your affairs in order. You've got two months to live. I mean, you go to the doctor then. You know, males don't go to the doctors all that often, do we? Because of our maleness, because of, I, I don't know, I mean, because, you know, I know when I don't want to go to the doctor is because I don't want to hear what the doctor has to say. You have high cholesterol or whatever it is. You need to lose weight. Fill in the blank for you. That's why I think males don't want to go to the doctor. They don't want to hear what the doctor has to say. But friend, let me tell you, you need to hear what Jesus the doctor has to say on this. You need to hear what Jesus the doctor has to say. You know, I, I just feel, 
I don't know, I'm a sentimental kind of guy, but as you know, but I just feel the older I get as each day goes by, time is running out. There is only one purpose, and that is to live for Jesus Christ. And as I heard last night, you know what? Heaven doesn't need my gifts. Heaven doesn't need my talents. Heaven doesn't need my knowledge. I have to pour it all out before I die. To my sons. To my daughter. Pour it all out. To live full but die empty. Live full but die empty. And You know, if you're breathing here still today, the truth is that God has, still has a mission and plan for you to fulfill. It's the only reason you're still breathing. I tell you, I tell you, it's all that matters, friends. And I just want to land this message today by addressing two groups of people in this room. I firstly want to speak to those of you who would say, Blake, I'm too bad a person to be a candidate for God's grace. You know you are a sinner. You know you aren't well, but you believe you are beyond the reach of God's grace. Let me say to you that if you feel that way, that you are the perfect candidate. But you may say, look, Blake, you don't understand. You don't understand. I look at pornography weekly. Perfect candidate. I binge drink every weekend. Perfect candidate. I had an abortion or paid for an abortion. Perfect candidate. I'm a fake and I'm a phony. Perfect candidate. I'm a rotten husband. Perfect candidate. You are not outside the invitation of Christ that Christ saves. That Christ saves murderers just like the Apostle Paul. And orphans and gamblers and drug users and egotistical middle class people all who are in this room. All you have to do is admit you need his cure and humbly ask him for mercy. You don't have to clean yourself up. You don't have to clean yourself up to come. Come as you are. Kurt Cobain got it right in that song. Come as you are. And cry out to him for mercy. Come as you are. Have you heard of ABC? Not the not the not Australian Broadcasting Company. I never watched them, but not not A B C D. But have you heard of ABC? Acceptance before change. Acceptance before change. We accept people as they are. Do we not? Do we, as the church, do we accept people as they are? Are we to accept people as they are? Or are we to say, no, hang on a minute. I always pick on you. (laughs) Hang on a minute. You're not good enough. You don't measure up. Go clean yourself up first before you come and enter into this place. Is that how it works? No, no, it shouldn't work that way. Everyone is welcome. Acceptance before change. So let me ask this question. Do we accept gay people at Devonport Church of Christ? Uh, Well, of course we do. We let gossipers through the front door this morning. Hello? We let slanderers through the door this morning. We let sinners through the door this morning. We don't ask people to change before acceptance. We don't ask a cap client to change before acceptance. 
We don't ask our young people to change before being accepted at Ignite Youth. We don't say, clean up your messy, sinful life before the Christian church accepts you. We say, come as you are. It is good. But somewhere along the line, the Christian church has got it around the wrong way where we think that, that you have to dress a certain way, look a certain way, come from the right neighborhood to be accepted. But that's not Jesus. That's got nothing to do with Jesus. And if you think it does, you are lost. Now, am I saying now, Jesus loves us so much that he takes us and accepts us who we are and where we're at. But Jesus loves us so much that he refuses to leave us where we're at. So I'm not condoning particular lifestyle. I don't condone gossipers. I don't, we don't condone sin. But we're all in the same boat. We're all broken, we're all messed up, and we're all cracked pots. And if you think you're not a cracked pot, you are lost, and you need to make an appointment with the doctor. Go get an amen. This is the essence of the gospel. This is the essence of Luke's gospel. And do we get it right? No, we don't always get it right. I'm so glad that I believe that we are an accepting church here at Devonport Church of Christ. You know, we're not perfect. We're a work in progress, but everyone's welcome. I mean, the church I grew up in had a had a Wollongong had had a, 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 a like a statement that said a church anyone can come to. Is that true about us? A church anyone can come to. Well, it ought to be. Regardless of your, regardless of who you are, regardless of your your, your status financially, your address, your, your 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 the color of your skin. Regardless of even your sexual orientation, that you're welcome. And then we just we accept before change because we believe that Jesus changes. I don't change anybody. Jesus changes, yeah? That's the gospel I, I know. If that's not the gospel you know, then, then I don't know, maybe I'm re- you're reading a different Bible to me. But friends, it's acceptance before change. I mean, I just want to ask you a question. How, so, you know, the Pharisees don't understand that. Religious people in Western churches don't understand that, acceptance before change. But that's what we've got to be. We accept gossipers right through to adulterers. How would you know if you're a, you were a religious Pharisee or not? Well, you may be a Pharisee if you won't spend time with your foul-mouthed co-workers because you're afraid they might, might make you look bad. You may be a Pharisee if you have to put yourself if you put yourself in the category of good and you point at others and put them in the category of bad. You may be a Pharisee if you try to get others to obey God's commandments before you share the message of Jesus Christ with them. You may be a Pharisee if you want to have control and power over others. Would you stand? No, sit down. We're going to do communion. (laughs) Got that one wrong. I'm just checking you, you know. Just hey, listen, friends. You see, the 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 Pharisees were doctors who would never see patients. Imagine that. Imagine if you were a doctor down at the what do they call it? The super super clinic, super duper clinic. Imagine, imagine, imagine. If you went down to the super clinic and the doctors refused to see patients. The Pharisees were doctors who refused to see patients and quarantined them. Whilst Jesus is the great physician who sees the, who sees the contagious and heals them. Jesus hasn't come to save people who think that they are well. 
Jesus hasn't come to save people who think nothing is wrong with them. Jesus has come to save people who know something is wrong and will admit they're sick. Do you know that you're sick? Do you know that you're sick? Are you righteous or repentant? Because let me tell you, either way, you need to call the doctor and make an appointment. If you're righteous, you'll walk out of here saying, I'm fine, I'm good enough. By walking out that way, though you perceive yourself to be righteous with God, God won't, and it's his opinion is what matters in the end. But if you're repentant, would you, before we, hit, we head into a time of communion, would you pray this prayer of repentance silently with me as I close? Would you bow your heads? Heavenly Father, I'm sorry for the ways I perceive myself as better than others. I do this by the little judgments I make in my heart towards others. Father, I confess this is sin. Would you help me to change? Help me invite broken people who don't know you into my life. Help me eat and drink with people who don't know you just like your son Jesus did. And help me to talk.